So my name is Heather Miller. I'm a professor at Northeastern University. I'm the director of the Scala Center at EPFL. So I got one foot in academia and one foot in industry land. Um, and actually, um, this, this talk comes out of a course that I, I gave last fall at Northeastern University. It was a grad course um, called Programming Models for Distributed Computing. And um, actually, there's even a book that kind of came out of it that's not totally finished yet. Uh, but all the students in the course wrote this book with me. And um, I have to edit it. It needs some work. But it's got a lot of really cool information in it. And this is actually, like this talk is just about one week of course material. So <laughs> uh, one and a half, maybe two weeks of course material. So there's a lot of, a lot of interesting information and a, and, a, and a lot of stuff to be found at this, at this book. There's a, a link on the slide. Um, I'll, I'll put links up on the internet if you, if you look around afterwards. Um, but anyway, um, so that's, that's an aside. Um, but sort of one of the things that kind of um, I, I really like about, about not just, you know, research in general, but about kind of looking back at sort of the history of things and how things came to be how they are now, is that research, it's really animated. It doesn't really look like that necessarily. Um, perhaps from the outside, it looks more like this. You have, <laughs> you, you know, I think people sometimes look at academic research kind of pessimistically, uh, you know, where, where research papers are all some crusty looking PDFs and big piles that are a pain in the neck to download and read. They have way too much, too many pages, too much convoluted mo motivational statements that lack any sort of actual real world context and they solve problems that nobody cares about. And like, you know, this is some guy in a room that's never seen the daylight before and I'm pretty sure that this is what a lot of people think research is about. Um, but I actually think it's, it's, it's a little bit more dynamic. They miss these year, multi-year long evolving and animated debates where researchers around the world are solving similar problems. And, and these different ideas and, and solutions and things, they're super animated if you look at these things over a long period of time. And unfortunately, they're evolving via PDFs, which people think are ultimately unsexy. Um, so at the end of this talk, I hope that I, I, I will have convinced you that some things going on in research land uh, are not like crusty piles of PDFs sitting around somewhere describing esoteric things that never went anywhere. Uh, and instead we go to the, like a dynamic view of arguments and designs and languages and you know things just evolving over decades with many design decisions from some of these so-called esoteric languages actually becoming somehow mainstream and then finding their way into sexier things that you guys use more often. Um, so, okay, this is about distributed programming languages, so does, can anybody name uh, some, some distributed programming languages? Okay, you guys know Chris then. <laughs> so, Chris is going to be so happy that you guys said LASP was a distributed programming language before Erlang. <laughs> like, clearly that means it's more often more widely used. Okay, so we have LASP, and we have Erlang, what else? Come on, there's got to be a couple more. I, I've never heard of that one, what is it? Shapel. Cool. All right. I'm going to look that one up. Give me one more. Linda. Linda. Yeah. Cool. All right. There's, there's like umpteen zillion. Um, some you've heard of, some you've not heard of. Mirage, maybe that's one you've not heard of. Orca. I'm sure you probably didn't hear of that one. Um, but there's a lot. I can't talk about every single one of them, but I'm going to go way too fast through at least seven of them, and you're going to hate me for it. <laughs> um, so I can't get into a ton of detail, but you know, we can just kind of touch on the big ideas. So the first paper I'm going to delve into is one by Barbara Liskoff in 1988. Uh, it's about a programming language called Argus, and if you're not familiar with, with Barbara Liskoff, uh, you really should be, because uh, she won the Turing Award in 2008. Uh, she laid the groundwork for a lot of things in object-oriented programming. She uh, was known for this language called Clue, CLU, I guess is what some people call it, uh, that they worked on in the mid-70s. Uh, and it introduced the, uses, uh, the use of, of classes with constructors and methods. It also used, uh, introduced a little thing called abstract data types. I don't know if you've ever heard of these things. Iterators, uh, type safe parameterized types, and uh, an important definition of subtyping in object-oriented programming uh, that, that people uh, commonly use called the Liskov substitution principle. So, uh, uh, so she's, she's done a lot of things, and you should know who she, ex who she is. So while she's kind of like a Mick Jagger or, or something in the land of object-oriented programming, um, maybe you don't know that she made this weird, wonky language in the 80s called Argus uh, for distributed programming. And actually, it was super influential, and you're, you know, you're going to be like, what, really? So um, back in the day, uh, she had this observation, and I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, distribution gives rise to some problems that do not exist in a centralized system or that 
you know, exist in a less complex form in a centralized system. For example, a centralized system is either running or it's crashed, but a distributed system may be partly running and partly crashed. Okay, cool. So both the nodes and network may fail. The network may lose or delay the delivery of messages, or messages uh, may just come out of, come out of order. Um, yet somehow programs should remain running, and she had this idea in the 80s. Um, and one thing that she thought was super important was that their, um, oops, is that data uh, should remain consistent when these situations happen. So this is a really big deal. Uh, she was like, look, if everything crashes or a bunch of things crash, um, we shouldn't, you know, have screwed up bank accounts because of it. So we need strong consistency. And she introduced this idea in, 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 a, in, in the, you know, in the, in the context of a programming language, which it didn't, hadn't really been thought of in this context before. So um, this, this paper actually runs through an example in banking. Um, and uh, she, she notes a couple of things. She notes two things. Um, so on, on the one hand, uh, concurrent activities may interfere with one another. That's a problem. And on the other hand, um, there might be some kind of failure that, that occurs. And these things, we don't really do anything about in programming languages that, that we use now. right? So this object-oriented thing called Clue, other things. So, in the face of these two things, Argus must, must provide some kind of strong consistency, is what she says. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's great to kind of show these people's words rather than to make up my own myself. Um, so I'd like to just quote her here. So she introduces Argus to support programs like a banking system to capture, uh, you know, and always to be in this object-oriented context. So she introduces two concepts to solve these things. On the one hand, you have something called a guardian which is like a special object that, that runs procedures in response to remote requests. And then she introduces another thing um, in the context of this language that should make consistency happen, uh, which are atomic transactions. So computations should always be organized as atomic transactions. And so, so these are sort of the two biggish ideas. And these guardian things fall into this world of object-oriented programming, right? Um, so guardians, uh, like I said, it's like an object, a special kind of abstract object whose, whose purpose is to encapsulate a, a resource or resources. Um, importantly, uh, the state of the resource is maintained in, data, in, the, in the objects stored in the guardian. So these things are isolated. The, the, the stuff inside of an, uh, a guardian is not ac accessible outside of a guardian. And the only way that anybody could actually manipulate anything inside anything uh, inside of one of these special objects is via uh, a handlers. Another, another guardian has to call some kind of handler that affects something inside of a guardian. Okay. So the key thing to hold on to here is that that uh, even though um, uh, uh, what's inside of a guardian is a, a dynamic collection of data objects, they're not accessible directly by anybody. They're isolated. So that's a guardian. Um, and this is the very, very beautiful picture that was in the paper, trying to draw a picture of all the things that could happen inside of a guardian. It's not exactly the best picture. Um, but the idea here is that uh, you have all kinds of things. You've got objects, and you have processes, and all kinds of stuff going on inside of this guardian. And then you have these handlers. In this case, one is called in queue, another one is called check. It doesn't really matter, the example here. But this is how you affect the stuff in going on inside of it. Uh, so yeah, just to summarize, Guardian encapsulates state. It contains a dy dynamic collection of objects. Uh, they're like an abstraction over a node, or like they're like a microservice or something. Um, interestingly, they can be moved. Uh, and the Guardian can create other Guardians dynamically. So these are kind of what a Guardian looks like, what's inside of one, and kind of what they can do. And I mentioned there are these handlers uh, that, pr uh, oops. A guardian permits its resources to be accessed by, uh, me by means of these special procedures called handlers. Right? As I mentioned, it was the way to affect the stuff going on inside of it. Um, yep, and, and also handler calls can be location independent. So you can be on some other node somewhere and call a handler that affects a guardian somewhere else. Right? That makes some kind of sense. Cool. So that's, that's, that's kind of like the, the high level picture. You don't have to actually try to read this because you definitely can't. This is just a screenshot from, from the paper of what the code kind of looks like. So this is this right here is supposed to be an entire banking application for one bank. Uh, so this is like one branch of a bank. And all that really matters here are the colors. So here you have uh, kind of where a, this guardian for a branch starts and where it ends. So it's like an object, again, has a bunch of stuff inside of it. 
the stuff that's inside of it. Uh, so there are handlers that, that other guardians can call to affect all, all kinds of state that's inside of it. And the other things are like types and, and sort of local data structures inside of it. So bank account numbers and other things like a table of banks, bank account numbers. Okay, but fine, the whole motivation behind this programming language was, well, partial, avail partial failure should somehow be addressed uh, in, in Argus. So, so how can it be addressed by guardians? Um, so basically, this goes back to this, this, this atomic actions point. So um, the idea is that, uh, you know, I'll just go here. So there are these atomic ap actions that, uh, that, that um, Argus makes possible. So all of these, these calls to handlers and things, uh, they should be atomic. Uh, and by that, they, you know, they're not separate. You, know, they're, 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 you can't separate them. They're one big action. Um, and actions, they have to be serializable. So if you run a group of them, they always have to be uh, executed as if they were run uh, sequentially. And they have to be total. So either it completes entirely or it, it fails entirely and it has no visible effect. So that's the idea. Uh, so serializability solves the concurrency problem and totality uh, solves the failure problem. And like I said, these things are indivisible, they're atomic. Um, and this is all achieved by your favorite thing on the planet, which is definitely locking and synchronization. I know everybody in this room really likes this. Uh, everything is all read-write locks. Um, and there's this cool way of kind of making a little hierarchy of these things so you know, things can be organized in, in terms of like two-phase commits. Doesn't really matter. Um, and then if you're partway through uh, trying to do something and then part of your, your thing fails or something, uh, there's, there's a way to recover, to roll back, uh, to, you know, to, to stop this commit from, from starting or, or this to, whatever, to, to stop everything from being committed. Uh, and, and this is done via versioning. And then, of course, communication between um, remote guardians is done by uh, RPC. So it's all synchronized and locked and everything. Uh, and it's you know, definitely not super performant. But look, strong consistency, that's cool. And another thing that you might not know about Argus is that uh, promises came from Argus. So I'm not going to go into that. That's all, like another week and a half of, of material. Um, but the idea of promise pipelining, because we realize, huh, RPC can be really slow if it's all synchronous, um, hey, we can make it asynchronous with promises, and they're strongly typed, and that's really great. So there's another paper uh, written by, by Barbara Liskoff called Promises, Linguistic Support for Efficient Asynchronous Procedure Calls in uh, Distributed Systems. I encourage you to have a look at that, but just note, hey, this is where promises came from. OK, one short note about how Argus was implemented. It was just calling random stuff in like a special research kernel. Um, it was completely coupled with the kernel. So everything, networking, storage, all that stuff, it re you know, required a special research implementation of Unix they were using. Um, and yeah, I mean, she didn't make any sort of modifications to this research thing that I think somebody else was working on. But still, it was completely coupled to this one version of Unix. All right, that's all I'm going to say about Argus. Just try to remember all of that. OK? So the next thing I'm going to talk about is Emerald. Emerald's another programming language from the 80s. Um, I'm going to zoom in right here because I'm pretty sure that this is not a quote from Andrew Black and, and all of those people. This is definitely a quote from Chris Micklejohn in 2017. Even though it says it's from Emerald in 1987, they say, well, distributed systems are now commonplace in 1987. Obviously, they were. Um, the, programming, uh, the programming of distributed applications is still somewhat of a black art. It's definitely not a black art anymore, right? Um, we believe that the complexity of distributed applications is heightened by the lack of programming language support for distribution. I swear, Chris said that like two days ago, right? I don't know if he's copying it out of the paper or what. Anyway, these are some of the guys that wrote the paper. This was back when they put people's pictures in the papers. Isn't this cool? I, I know a few of them, and they're much older now, but I, liked, I like that they have these these pictures, you know, it's really cool. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a silly point. Anyway, the goal, the goal of Emerald was language support for distribution, yay. Uh, so this actually all started in other languages, actually a few other languages. One called Eden, which was a, itself an extension of another language called uh, Concurrent uh, Euclid. And basically they took Concurrent Euclid and they were like, hey, let's, you know, add RPC to this thing and make it distributed. That would be so cool. Um, but as a result of doing that, they ended up with two different versions of objects. 
And they thought that was ugly, you know? Uh, so on the one hand, you had these mobile objects implemented in Eden, but actually they were extremely expensive to use and nobody used them. Instead, developers like snuck around and then just reused concurrent Euclid objects. Uh, and then they would communicate through shared memory instead of RPC, like they were supposed to. Obviously, that's bad. I mean, assuming this was all in the same node, by the way. They're doing shared memory. And then, you know, if it's, you're trying to talk to somebody else in another node, then you're in trouble. In any case, um, they're like, let's try, to, let's try to fix these things. Let's try to unify uh, this, this object system, because it's, it's pretty bad. And it's also, you know, not very performant. So, hey, let's make Earl, uh, this language called Emerald to address some of these issues. Um, so I'm going to read two more quotes to you, because I'm, I'm sure you love it. Um, so we believe that the complexity of distributed applications is heightened by the lack of programming language support for distribution. That was Chris. Um, the rest is Andrew Black and his friends. For example, most distributed applications are implemented by calling operating system, uh, I'm sorry, operating system uh, communications pr primitives, such as send and receive. And the programmer is responsible for locating the communications target, ex like explicitly packaging parameters and so on. That really sucks. Like, you're just, you know, I'm in a programming language and I actually just have to like go down to the operating system and then package everything up, make packets myself, send stuff around. That's horrible. So Emerald, we want to go beyond sort of syntactic, simple syntactic support for message send and receive. We want to address some of the fundamental semantic problems of distribution. Okay. So note this fundamental semantic problems of distribution. What are they? Obviously, it's objects. Because programming language designers are like, if it's an ugly object system, this is bad. This is the most important thing to distribution. So basically, they wanted a single object model that is performant and used uh, for both programming in the small and the large, uh, can be used for local objects as well as remote ones. That was, that was a very important concern for them. Um, they thought abstract types were very important. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. That actually turns out to be much more important. Um, and then this explicit notion of, of object location and mobility. So you should be able to move your objects around. So the three things that they, they, that they offer with this programming language, the obje you know, these objects that I mentioned before, emerald objects which offer a uniform semantic model of computation. Um, they're implicitly um, units of distribution and movement. They're separate entities which can communicate between each other via message passing. Um, and they're mobile, right? Like they can be moved around the network. They have a few things, identity, um, they have some way of being represented, they have some operations, some way of processing these things, whatever, but more importantly, they have these other strange attributes. One is location, and the other one is that an object can be immutable. Hmm, that's interesting. So, uh, you know, it actually turns out that immutability was just kind of like a marker, not really immutable, but um, whatever, details. Um, and location. So you should be able, like, location should be a part of your object. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it doesn't really, this, this is maybe an, a less important detail is that multiple objects actually exist inside of this thing and are selected by the compiler to make things more efficient. So you don't have that funny thing where programmers are using the wrong kind of object for the situation they're trying to, to be in. So the compiler selects the right kind of object for you instead. But you see all one kind of object, right? But what's more important to me, or what I think is actually a bigger deal, are abstract types. So the idea is that abstract types, they're statically typed, but um, they argue that, OK, well, static, type, static typing has advantages. Uh, you know, and, and the big deal here at, at this time in 1987 was that it enables better error notification. And by better, they mean better than small talk. <laughs> so that was the motivation, which I think is cute and great. Um, but Turns out that abstract types were a more important design consideration because they were designed to be used in so-called open systems. They use the word open systems, where objects may be added to a running system. So you need some kind of interface. And then you can swap in a different implementation for that interface. So you want, they wanted abstract types to be able to, like these interfaces defined in them, to be able to um, allow old code to invoke new objects, basically. That was the idea. Um, which, that's super cool, right? This is, this is an awesome thing. Um, the next thing is so-called distribution support, and this is super messy. Uh, what's under this, this, this like, subsection here? It's a ton of things. But uh, to try and keep it short, um, you know, this is about concurrency, having multiple nodes, um, having object location baked into these objects, um, you know, sort of encapsulating all of this stuff 
uh, and then to let people actually manually move objects around if they feel like they should. Um, and whatever, that's, it's actually extremely involved how this works. Um, and then they had to introduce a few interesting things um, called like call by move semantics for, you know, arguments that are on different machines or something. This gets super messy. In any case, this is support for distribution. Okay, all of these things to try and make these mobile objects work. And I'm just going to say again, uh, how, is, how is Emerald implemented? So let's try to remember the how were the, each of these languages implemented point. So it was imp implemented in a very painstaking way. The compiler, again, was very closely coupled to the kernel. Uh, it actually defined an interface with the kernel so that operations could be either performed by the kernel, the compiler, or even compiler-generated code. Like, it's super baked into it. And even uh, more interestingly, Emerald was the only thing that could run on that kernel. Like, nothing else was allowed. Okay. So this was, you know, super tightly, I mean, and, you know, it must have taken a zillion years to, to try and make this thing work. Okay, we all know Erlang. I'm going to spend around 30 seconds actually talking about it since it's not such a, a foreign concept to most people here. Um, I say Erlang came out in the 1990s. Its first public release was 2000. The paper was written in 1990. This one that you see here was 2010 by Joe Erlang. I'm sorry, Joe Armstrong in the uh, uh, CACM. He could be Joe Erlang. That's like a pretty cool name. Um, but I think we know most of these things, right? So I'm just going to run through a quick summary. So uh, it's a functional programming language. Uh, it's made up of lightweight processes, which is, you know, like the, the, the main thing that Erlang offers. So um, the idea is that, pro like, how you should write Erlang programs is that processes are typically created for a short period of time. They live long enough to do one simple thing, to handle one simple request, and then, then they can just go away. You don't have to worry or care about these things. So that allows there to be umpteen zillion processes concurrently running at the same time. Of course, everything communicates via message passing. So this is how processes talk to each other. Things are immutable, um, variables are assigned once and can't be changed, and the most exciting thing to me is this very cool dynamic VM. So you have hot swapping is allowed, which is really neat. The idea is then you can upgrade applications while they're running without stopping them, super cool. And you can't really talk about Erlang without mentioning OTP, which is a bunch of of, I would say, just libraries that are, 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 are on top of Erlang that define all kinds of things. One thing that people use a lot are these supervisors, so you can have processes watching over other processes and handling their failures. Um, oh, another thing that I didn't, I didn't mention in the, the, the blue part or the dark, dark part of the slide is that also that you have this ability to uh, uh, like do linking, so one process can be notified if another process fails or disappears or something, right? So that's also very important. Because then you can, you know, you know if somebody somebody died or, or something something was failed. Um, again, we all kind of know Erlang a little bit, so I'm not going to say anything more about Erlang. Just kind of remember uh, Erlang for a second, and uh, it's a virtual machine basically um, compiled uh, that for for win uh, Windows and uh, I'm sorry Unix and Windows runs most places without issue. Super concurrency focused VM. Um, it's, I guess, the nicest way to, call, to describe it is like a process VM. Uh, so there's no actual connection to the OS processes running underneath. Uh, instead, the VM manages all of that itself, uh, and it can manage millions of processes. Um, so you can, yeah, you can have, have really a million processes sitting on top of just one OS process and have one thread per core, basically. Um, and of course, it has this really cool garbage collector that independently collects per process since all these processes are independent. They can't share memory and, and whatnot, so they have their own heaps. That's neat. Uh, and of course, this hot, hot, hot code reloading thing. So this is Erlang, right? Just footnote. Um, Linda. Has anybody heard of Linda? I think somebody mentioned Linda here, yeah? You've heard of tuple spaces, probably. Like, maybe you don't even know what they are. That's fine. They're really like out of this world, spacey, I have no idea, weird things, okay? So I'm gonna just kind of run through the idea of, uh, of, what, of what these tuple spaces are. Um, but the, the, main, the main point to remember here is that tuple spaces were introduced as an alternative to message passing. Um, so the argument is, well, message passing is no good. Uh, it's a coordination model that arises directly from the architecture of networks, that's, that's horrible, you know, we don't want that. Yet, the use of distributed data structures in a logically shared memory is natural. It's a naturally well-understood way to approach parallel programming, right? So guys, the principal argument uh, here is that distributed shared memory is, is inefficient. 
so if that's really all you have to say about it, I have an idea. Uh, we can, we can, whoops, we can come up with uh, a scalable and efficient implementation of shared memory. Um, and you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be building all of our applications around message passing because it's developed as some consequence of, of the fact, uh, this complaint that, that, uh, sh you know, distributed shared memory is inefficient. Like, so why do we have to, you know, so what, now we have to change how we think about everything and how we approach all problems just because of this one thing? Let's fix that, right? Okay, I still think it's a little crazy, but whatever. So Linda comes in, and they're like, look, we're gonna make this efficient, okay? We're gonna solve this problem. So they introduce this idea of tuple spaces, which are virtual, associative, uh, which is content addressable, logically shared memory. Okay, it's like a big cloud that you put things into and you take things out of, basically. You don't know how it works. <laughs> So, surprisingly, tuple spaces contain tuples, which are collect a collection of ordered sequences of, of, of data. And I mean, this is what they look like. I, I took this from the paper. This is a tuple. So you just put some data into a little thing with some commas between the different pieces of data. And you just insert that into your tuple space. That's it, really, that's what you do. So you put data into tuple, the tuple spaces in, in two ways, either serially or in parallel. So you have to create these things, this, this data, and then insert it into this tuple space. So the serial way to do it is to use this out method. Uh, so it creates data and inserts it one by one. Uh, like, you know, it serially goes through the, the arguments here, like evaluates them and then inserts the whole thing into uh, the tuple space. And uh, the parallel way, um, it's, it's a little bit different. So the idea is that uh, all arguments to eval are uh, evaluated in parallel, in separate processes, uh, while the original process that started this uh, continues immediately. So it's kind of a parallel, and then the thing goes into the tuple space. So that's the idea. You have like a sequential and parallel way of doing it. And again, associative memory, so there's no addresses. Uh, if you want to pull something out of this associative memory, uh, you know, the idea is that you retrieve things on the basis of the combination of their field values. So if I want to get things out of a tuple space, I have these weird patterns, uh, and I can either read things via these patterns, or I can uh, find a tuple via like a pattern, and I can remove it or just look at it, like read it. That's the idea. So um, this example here, this little RD thing, that's, that's the way to just, just read a tuple, and, and these little question marks, uh, this is how you say, well, this, you know, I, I want, uh, for example, a tuple A, B, C, D, uh, wait, A, B, C, D, yep, and, uh, or E, A, B, C, D, E, whatever. And, you know, I, I'm looking for A, basically, so I can pull it out by A. Does that make some kind of sense? It's a little, it's a little weird. So to read a five element tuple A, B, C, D, E, you can write like this R, D, A, and then these question marks for, for these other parameters that you want to match against. Uh, and you know, you'll get something back, basically. And interestingly, um, you know, if there are multiple things that match, just get an arbitrary one, or it blocks and waits until something matches that it can give you. Surely that's not a problem. <laughs> and therefore, tuple spaces are good, obviously. Um, and this, these, this is the argumentation for why tuple spaces are better um, than doing things via message passing because you have intentionally loose coupling amongst processes, uh, and messaging and message passing, on the other hand, you actually have to know what, what you know, other, other actors or whatever things are in the system, you have to actually uh, address a message to them uh, in a point-to-point -point system. And this, you don't have to know anything about your network, you don't have to know anything about the topology, you don't have to know about other people in your system, you just put your stuff into this big cloudy thing called a tuple space, and you get all this stuff out and you hope that it's the thing you wanted. So that's good. That's considered to be a win. Um, producers of tuples also don't have to coexist at the same time as the consumers do. Like you don't have to have two actors alive at the same moment. Uh, so you can have some process putting something into a tuple space and then three years later another one taking it out. Um, so tuples, uh, tuples remain in the space until they're explicitly removed. Also considered to be a good thing. Um, so Linda was actually implemented as a language extension. Uh, so there's, there's two variants of it, C Linda and Fortran Linda. And uh, the, really the most important thing to note here 
is that it was written in, in some kind of base language, in this case, either C or Fortran, and then, uh, or sorry, it was, sorry, it was a compiler that would generate C or Fortran, excuse me. Uh, and it would, you know, automatically generate required auxiliary routines or, you know, incorporate, uh, incorporate different sort of optimized kernel libraries to, you know, for that, that platform and that target and whatever uh, to support the Linda, the Linda operations at runtime. So that's how it was, how it was, how it was put together. Okay. Um, I'm going to, this is another like two second one. So Scala Actors isn't a language, it's a library and that's a big deal. Um, the idea was back in 2005 or 2006, we're like, hey, Erlang's a cool language, but the JVM, I don't know, threads are, are really heavyweight. Like, it would be really cool if we could have these lightweight processes on the JVM in Scala. That would be awesome if we could just, like, mix these things. But these JVM threads, what do we do? So, hey, let's do some of that process management that the Erlang VM does, but as a library with a thread pool. We can map it all down to JVM threads. And turns out that it worked. Uh, you could have these lightweight, uh, not, I wouldn't call them threads, but you know, they're actors, processes, whatever, a la Erlang, actually implemented on top of a fork join pool, and this was actually a really huge deal. Had a big impact. Uh, Akka later came out of this project uh, called Scala Actors. Um, and it was started by this guy here uh, called Philip. Um, anyway, so it was a big deal. And a lot, of people pop, a lot of people jumped on using the actor model in the JVM due to this actually working. And it was all implemented as a regular Scala library that ran on a regular, unmodified, nothing special JVM, and the same is true for Akka today. And uh, you have Martin Oderski like doing a little happy dance because he's like, yeah, look at that. If you go back to this little example here, you can't really see it very well, but there's this React thing, which is the message handler. You know, that, that's really neat because it looks like it's like a keyword in the language. It looks like it's built into the language, but it's just a library. So my language is awesome because it can support that stuff. And also, it can, you know, emulate this thing that required an entire VM, right? Woohoo! So that's, that's, you know, the Scala hooray. Cloud Haskell appeared a few years later. It was kind of like, hey, you know what? Simon Payton Jones was like, I think there are a lot of, a lot of different parallel programming paradigms in, par in practice. And the, the, the difference is really the cost model. I'm not a believer of the one-size-fits-all story about parallelism. I think we can't escape the idea that we will need to write parallel applications using different, parallel, different paradigms. And I'd like to build a language or a language ecosystem where you can use lots of different kinds of parallelism in the same single application even, where you can have maybe bits of task parallelism, bits of data parallelism, and bits of message passing all in the same application. So it's like, hey, Haskell. Kind of like, it would be cool if we had uh, some of these little Erlang message passy actor things. That would be really great. So, Simon Peyton Jones, not, in, not stopping there, believes, look, we can do much better than just having these, these actor things. You guys don't have types. We can fix that. And uh, everything is immutable also. <laughs> and our functions are idempotent, obviously better. Um, and, and sort of the, the reason why it's better is then you can, you know, if something crashes, you can run it somewhere else, you can reconstruct things clearly better. Uh, and, and you can separate pure and effectful code with monads, also better. So I think we can improve on this situation as sort of the basic idea. So you have processes in Cloud Haskell that are like actors. Um, they, they're blessed with this ability to, to send and receive messages. They're all lightweight and they don't require much overhead. Uh, messages as well. Uh, which are basically met the way that this works is um, the actual, well, so these things all have to be serialized, which is complicated. Don't worry about that. But the point is that uh, basically one of these processes can receive another, uh, another message, which doesn't have a, like a, an explicit type associated with it. And then it uses type inference to figure out what it is. There also exist channels, which are an explicit data structure to send a message of exactly one type to exactly one node. So whereas every single node can simply uh, receive messages of any type automatically and use type inference to kind of figure out what it's supposed to be, be it the methods or what, you know, whatever you're doing with it, or functions that you're using with it, um, nodes must be given an explicit send port structure that allows them to send a message of one type to a channel. So you have basically like kind of any message that you want and then like these type channels. And then they have special closures. So these are super restricted closures that only allow certain things to be in the environment and you have to say how everything is serialized to send it to send it along. So this is what Cloud Haskell provides in the shortest possible description. 
Um, and it's implemented as, as a library, uh, as, as a domain-specific language uh, with a little, a little bit of, of, of template Haskell mixed in there. And it looks a lot like Erlang, actually. So this is just, a, just to show you, you know, a little bit of code. This is uh, Haskell on the top and Erlang in the bottom, same ping pong application implemented. All right, and I have two more things I'm going to show you, and I told you, like, I'm already getting close to running out of time. So the next thing is Bloom. Have you guys heard of Bloom? Woo! Woo so I'm really sad that like I'm I'm already kind of close to the end of my time slot because I can't go as as slowly as I want to go on Bloom. So um, it's it's a it's, it's by a group called uh, it's by a, a guy named Peter Alvaro, which I hope you guys have all heard of. It came from a systems group at Berkeley. Um, and basically, it was attempting to cater to some of the, the actual paramount issues in the system community that typically escape the PL community. So, you know, namely, these, these, uh, these are issues surrounding things like coordination and data consistency that really nobody seemed to care about so much since Argus. Uh, and, you know, these things should be dealt with at the level of the programming model. So, uh, that's, that's kind of the why behind Bloom. Um, I, I, I don't have a lot of time to actually read the, read the quotes. Um, I'm going to put these slides up afterwards so you can have a look at this. This is really cool. Basically, they're saying, okay, ACID is slow. Like, you know, I, let's, let's have less coordination with things as things become more and more distributed, basically. And, uh, you know, we have this, this calm principle that kind of, you know, lets us reduce coordination. And, uh, you know, maybe we can put this into a programming language. It's kind of the idea. And we do this in a declarative language. So it's a declarative language that uses program analysis techniques, techniques which uh, enable both static analysis and runtime annotation, annotations on consistency. So you can, try to, you can make sure that, that consistency is, is you, you can say something about consistency with the, like, you know, by giving somebody a certain programming model, then analyzing either the code that they, they're analyzing the code that they write. So in this, in this analysis, like I said, it, it's based on this calm principle, which is uh, a tight, you know, this, this, this calm principle, it's a tight relationship between consistency and, and, and logical monotonicity. So monotonic, monotonic programs guarantee eventual consistency under any interleaving um, uh, delivery uh, and computation. So basically, the idea is, um, you know, you can deliver messages in any order or whatever, and the idea is that, you know, you should have the same uh, result, and that result should somehow be monotonic. So, um, by contrast, non-monotonicity uh, is, is basically requiring synchron synchronization points. So, if you have non-monotonic parts of your programs, then you have to synchronize around those points is what they observe. So, this calm principle is like, well, okay, monotonicity is important, basically. It's important to consistency. So, therefore, because uh, monotonicity is a big deal, there's no ordering. Programs are bundles of declarative statements about collections of tuples. Statements are de defined with respect to these weird timestamps, and there's no, no mutable state, si no side effects. And things happen in any order. They argue that um, ordering assumptions based on this traditional von Neumann architecture that sort of informed all of imperative programming, that's the problem. So therefore, we need no order at all. Order is gone. And then we, just make then we can do all kinds of analysis to make sure things are monotonic, and we can reason about where synchronization might have to occur. That's the idea. Um, I'm going to skip over the, you know, some of the operations, um, but the cool thing is that you have uh, a bunch of statements that operate on these weird time steps, uh, and then you get higher order functions. So you kind of reason in terms of these weird, these weird time steps, and then you have higher order functions to like, do more interesting things with. So just a, a, a note. And Bloom is implemented in, in Ruby, actually. A Bloom program is just a Ruby class definition. I'm telling you why, you know, this whole implementation point, because you should be noticing a pattern over time. The next one is LASP. Um, I'm going to go, since everybody thinks that LASP is the most well-known uh, distributed programming language, <laughs> I mean, really, guys, uh, LASP appeared because, you know, it's the future. It's 2015 when it was created. Everything is somehow distributed. You got mobile games and ad counters and this internet of whatever you want to call these things. I would use a different word, but whatever. So you have a bunch of things that are connected, and you got all these services being called all the time and really stupid small programs. So lots of things are happening. Uh, and synchronization gets a little ridiculous when one app has to make a calls with three dozen other, other services during its usage. So got to somehow reduce synchronization, yes. And also, you know, we can't get away from the idea that state has to be replicated somehow. Um, I can come up with a, a silly example of, of a game where you know you're, you're fighting with some other some other character, having a sword fight, uh, and you know you each have health, 
like health counters or whatever, um, but you can see each other's health counter because that's some replicated state, and if you're fighting this guy with a sword and you go into a tunnel because you're on a train and you're doing it on your phone, you gotta somehow, you know, continue playing or doing whatever, and then you both have to arrive at the same state. Either you died or he died, one of you died. So that's a situation where, you know, it's ex obviously extremely important, most important situation where you would ever need a uh, replicated state, obviously. <laughs> And CRDTs um, are a thing that uh, basically make it easier to reason about, repli like, re reason about a replicated state in a distributed system. And last, build CRDTs into the language. I would love to talk a lot about CRDTs, but the idea, it's again kind of related to monotonicity and all of these things, the idea is that you can uh, do a number of updates in any order, but you know, two replicas of the same set uh, should always arrive should always arrive at the same result, should always have, they should conserve, uh, converge to the same state. It's the basic idea, right? So eventually consistent. And then you can, you can take this model of a CRDT and implement many kinds of different data structures like sets or counters, registers, uh, dictionaries, graphs, etc. And LASP basically uh, piggybacks on this idea of a, of a CRDT and it's like, guys, we could build really like rich computations up by composing operations on these CRDTs. So these are like data structures. We can kind of like have functional, like higher order functions and we could compose stuff and it would be really cool. So last plus a number of APIs, this functional one, a set theoretic one, and then a core API which does basic stuff like binding and updating, things that you would expect. Um, and uh, what's most important is, you know, it's, it, it, this is what it looks like. If you have, you know, I, I know that you're all LASP users so I shouldn't show you pictures of what the code looks like. It's really boring, I guess. Um, but actually, it's an, so it's all implemented on top of Erlang. It's, a, it's, a, it's just an Erlang library, just an Erlang library. And it's built on top of React, uh, which provides a, a certain kind of CRDT called state-based CRDTs, and it's all implemented in Erlang, basically. Okay, so th I, that was seven programming, language, uh, seven programming languages, guys. So where did all the distributed languages go? That was the whole point of this, this talk. And what I, I hope to argue right now is that they didn't go anywhere, actually. All these distributed languages are just DSLs now, or libraries, or whatever you want to call them. Um, so at some point I say, well, you've got to ask yourself, what the hell is a programming language anyway? Do I need to implement an entire runtime system that futzes with my underlying kernel and all that to count it as a language? Uh, and I think, honestly, uh, I believe, is that we should probably stop calling some of these, these, these languages uh, languages. Instead, we should just call them programming models. Um, Haskell, Scala, uh, Erlang, Java, all of these languages have proven to be um, good languages to embed entirely new uh, uh, smaller languages or, or paradigms for, for doing distributed computation in. Um, and and I, you know, there's really no harm in piggybacking on, on the entire amount of work that somebody else has done to futz with you know, some kernel or, or to, to, to do some kind of you know, jitting or get, to get performance or to get portability out of, out of, out of some sort of underlying uh, system. Uh, so this DSL approach, I think, uh, is actually where, uh, you know, where a lot of these distributed programming languages are going. They're actually becoming new programming models implemented in, 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 inside of another uh, uh, language. And uh, I'm going to end on this one, this one sort of like funny summary, in my view, of kind of how I look at research. I started this conversation or this, this talk about, hey, research is actually like this fast moving thing if you kind of like zoom out in time a little bit and it's like people arguing about stuff. So you have this really funny dynamic conversation going on over the course of many decades where you have Argus is like, hey guys, consistency is super important. Also, we should worry about partial failure. I'm pretty sure that's gonna be a big deal. It's 1988, seven, six. It's gonna be a, a big deal, we should focus on this. And you know what, RPC is a good way to do requests and to make requests and do response. We should do RPC and promises are great. One language came up with like, a, well, they didn't come up with RPC, but you know, fought for it. Put all, all these ideas like in one language, which was, was pretty cool. And then you have Emerald who pops up like, hey, objects, objects, objects. Objects should be unified, they should be mobile, they should be efficient. I agree, definitely efficient, abstract types too. Erlang appears, message passing is king, processes should be many and light, and they should be totally independent. Okay, that was, that was kind of some of the ideas that Argus also uh, fought for. Linda appears somewhere out in, you know, the corner field. Guys, 
message passing is totally crazy. Um, shared memory model is definitely more natural. Like, this is how we think. So tuple spaces, we can make them efficient. You know, that's going to be the solution. And then you have a Scala and, and Haskell appearing here. Like, man, Erlang is kind of sexy. We like Erlang a little bit. Do you think we could embed this Erlang stuff in our language? Hey, Scala is like, we don't need a whole VM to manage these lightweight processes. We can do it as a library. Awesome. Same, same kind of uh, idea in Haskell, uh, but we can also do better. Types and monads and yay. Channels, woo. Boom, boom appears like, guys, programming language people, programming language people, okay, really. You guys forgot about the most important thing. Totally, that's consistency. Everything that you're doing should be monotonic because you have no idea what order things are gonna happen in and, you know, make sure that parts of your program are monotonic so we can remove coordination. Data log is great and everything should be disorderly. And programming languages, people are like, whoa, I don't, what is, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Not data log, disorderly. They know what data log is. Um, and last appears, it's like, hey, consistency is important, but so is composability. So let's put these things into a language. Let's put these, let's compose uh, these, this, this, you know, these monotonic things together and, you know, m make this available to people in a programming model. That would be way more easy to reason about uh, than a data loggy thing. So these are really conversations, and I hope you see that at the end of this. Um, and, and at that point, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm like rambling for so long. I'm going to say thank you for coming, and you should probably come ask me questions instead of uh, uh, raising your hand and, and, and doing questions now. You should also run to the keynote, because I definitely went over time, and I'm sorry. <laughs>